He's not interested in routine. All right. Thank you, Father. Waiting for a hand to go up at the back. I don't know. If you're watching us online, uh, you're very welcome uh, to join us today. Um, wow, we've been having a glorious time in worship and um, <clears throat> still are. It's not stopped. It's not going to stop. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Wow. I am... Um, I'm very happy because uh, during the worship, I was, one of my kids came up to me at one point and was worship, quietly worshipping. And on the outside, it, it, you know, it didn't look any different maybe to a normal week, but I just suddenly found myself weeping. And I was like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> I was just weeping. And I, just, um, I didn't know what it was for a while. I was like, what's going on? I feel like I look like a bit of a mess. I'm like trying to wipe the tears away. And, um, and then I just got this sense of like, they're going to receive their tongues today. And so I just laid my hands on them and they just received their tongues in the worship. <clears throat> and I just feel like the Lord is saying that I'm releasing a spirit of worship and revival in the young people in our church. And I'm doing it now. He's doing it now. Wow. Thank you, Father. Wow. So one thing that I'm, God is challenging me more and more at the moment is um, what's possible when we simply abide in the agape. Whoa. Whoa. The Whoa. The unconditional agape love of God. What's possible? Is there any limitation to what can happen when you simply abide in his agape love? I believe that one of the a great key to life is recognizing and responding to that the secret power of being loved by him when it's inconvenient. Or being loved by him when it seems mundane. Like the other day, I was literally just putting washer fluid into the car. And I was unscrewing a bottle of washer fluid. And then I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to let him love me now. <laughs> and then I just, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, Father. As this like sweet honey just comes into me. Wow. There's no mundane with him. There's no mundane with him. There's no mundane with him. I really believe that it's in those unplanned, unscheduled, in-between moments of life, I believe that's where the depth of my relationship with him is often forged. When I didn't schedule a quiet time or a prayer meeting or whatever it is, why? Why is that such a big deal? I believe part of it is because he wants us to really discover that he's the initiator. So often we come to him like we're initiating. Oh, God, we love you. We just want to experience your presence. And he's like, I, I, yeah, me too. <laughs> I've been here the whole time. I've been waiting. When you made that cup of tea the other day and you were just whistling some song you heard on the radio, I was, I was there. I was present. How present were you? I was, um, the other day, I was um, working in a coffee shop. Sometimes when I'm doing sort of laptop kind of work, I try and get out and about and work in coffee shops because when I worked in London, I was always out and about meeting different people. But when you work in a church, it's very easy to spend a lot of your time either here or if you're at a meeting or doing something like that. And I'm like, I just need to be out and about with people. So I try and regularly get out there and work in a coffee shop. Now, this coffee shop was right next to a shopping center. Now, I, my default is to be like, oh, there's a lot of people that could get healed in that shopping center. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. And God, God was just like, the other day, I was like, no, Dave, 
just sit in my love. And I'm like, but there's, there's so, so many people in there, God. Dave, <laughs> just sit in my love. I'm like, okay. All right, well, I'm going to just lean into your words of knowledge now, God. There's probably a word of knowledge you want to release in this, like, Dave, <laughs> stop it. Is my love enough for you? Like, if the only success measure you got today was that you encountered my love, is that not enough? Do you have to add on to it all this other stuff? And I'm like, but God, you want me to do that stuff. You said it. You said, heal the sick, raise the dead. You want me to go out there. You want people to get saved. You want people to meet you. But Dave, if that doesn't happen, is my love enough for you? Do you need to add to that? So I was like, okay. I just sit in your love. So I just sat there with my coffee, my laptop, and I'm just like sitting in his love. And I just consciously let all that stuff go. And then I just got this little whisper saying, okay, the next person that comes in here, <laughs> the next person that comes in here is going to... Um, They've been drawn in here to come to you because they need something from you, but they don't know that. And you need to buy them a coffee. That's all I got. And so literally a minute after that, this guy walks in and he asks for a tap water, nothing else. It's quite unusual. And then he comes and sits right there next to me there and gets all these things out on the table. And I just turned to him and I just said, I'd love to buy you a coffee. Can I just buy you a coffee? And he was like, oh. That would be amazing. He goes, I've got no money at all. I've got nothing. I've just been made homeless. I can't buy a coffee, can't buy anything. And so I bought him a coffee, sat down, and I just said, should I tell you why I did that? And he was like, okay. I was like, I was just sat here, and God, I'm a Christian. God said to me, the next person who comes in here, you have to buy him a coffee. And he was like, wow. And I said, have you any idea how much God loves you? I mean, he loves you. And he goes, no. And I said, would you like to hear about that? And he said, yeah. And then just the love of God, the presence of his love just fell on this guy. I, all I've done is buy him a coffee. I didn't do anything clever. All I got is coffee. That's all I'm going with is just coffee. But Buying a coffee when you're abiding in his love doesn't have to just be buying a coffee. He let me just, he just sat there quietly as I explained to him the gospel. And then how I said to him how actually there's this separation. between. I said, God's presence is actually here everywhere all the time. But we live in ignorance of that. And we're actually separated in that in our own minds, in our own lives because of our actions and our decisions And actually, what can happen is, what Jesus did is he paid the price. So that separation can be replaced by peace. You can be united with God. You can be filled with that love. I said, would you like that today? And he said, yes. That he got born again right there and then. Then he got filled with the Spirit. (laughs) Then he got healed. It was so simple, just buying a coffee. Anything's possible when you're sitting in the love of God. There's nothing more important that you can do than just sit in the agape love of God. I feel like there's something that God spoke to me about the other day. And I want you to, I want you to be brave, okay? One of the things about an environment like this is we celebrate the miraculous, don't we? And we love seeing God do what only he can do. And we're never going to stop celebrating things like that. We're never going to stop celebrating the miraculous. We're never going to stop celebrating healings and signs and wonders. But there's, there's a strange contradiction sometimes that can happen unintentionally, I believe, believe as a result of being in an environment like this, that if you're someone who doesn't see signs and wonders happen every day in your life, that whilst you're attracted to an environment that is going after that, 
what can happen is you can actually start to feel more inadequate because you don't see that in your life. And the Lord, if that's you, the Lord wants you to know there's nothing inadequate about you. There is nothing inadequate about you. There's nothing more supernatural than love. That is the most supernatural thing there is, his love. And you have that. If, if you've ever felt that, if you've ever had a feeling of, you know what, am I, if there's is something missing in me, am I not, am I, do I not have what these guys have? Do I not, am I not like, ready yet? Am I not like complete? Because they seem to be walking in all this stuff and I don't see that all the time. If you've ever had that feeling, I really believe God wants to break that off you today. Would you stand if you've ever felt that? Just repeat after me. Father, I break agreement with the lie that there is anything inadequate about me, that I'm in any way insufficient. I break agreement with that lie right now. Thank you that you filled me with your agape love. And you're always filling me with it. And I don't need anything else. In Jesus' name, amen. We will always love miracles at Eastgate. But one thing I don't love is people feeling like second-class Christians. There's nothing like that here. You've got everything you need. So just go and love them Go and love the world with whatever you feel like you've got, whatever you feel like you don't got. Just go love the world with it. Just go. Just go. If you've got the love of God in your heart, you've got everything you'll ever need. You are fully packed, resourced, ready to go. Just go and love them. Go and love the hell out of them, literally. <laughs> You're not missing anything. All right. Who was here for Encounter Weekend, which is like a while back now, end of January? It's always a great time, but it felt like, it felt like something sig quite significant happened this time, particularly during the worship. The worship was like, we just got caught up in the awe of God and like the fear of the Lord. It was such a beautiful, beautiful thing. But then after that as well, we had this experience where... Um, Three of us all spoke on the same passage that day, when no one knew it was going to happen. And apparently, late, earlier on that week, the, same, the exact same passage had been spoken on, on our online school as well on the Wednesday night. And um, this was about the Luke 24, the road to Emmaus. And that story, you know, where the, you've got the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes and walks with them, and they don't realize it's him. And then he breaks the bread and gives thanks, and then their eyes are opened. You remember that? And um, they realize, oh, come to think of it, weren't our hearts burning the whole time? Our hearts were burning the whole time while he was talking to us. And I feel like I've been like, why is this highlighted, God? Like, what is it about this? And on that day in, on Encounter Week, are we all touched on different aspects of it, but there's one thing that is, seems to be highlighted is this thing about burning hearts. I feel like we, as a church, have been in a burning hearts season, if you will, where, like those two disciples, it's like our eyes are being opened up to the reality of like, oh, we were seeking him, but he was really with us the whole time. His presence, he was walking with us the whole time. 
And not just our awareness, but then our value for it starts to shift as well. Like that God's taking us a journey where things that used to seem important suddenly become less important because we realize God is with us and we need to adjust around that. What did those two disciples do? They went, they were on their way to Emmaus. As soon as they had the bread broken and then Jesus disappeared, they were like, we need to go back to Jerusalem. Their priorities changed. They responded to what had just happened. Now, I mention this because this is not the verse I'm teaching out of today exactly, but I wanted to give that as context for what I'm going to talk about because I think it's important. Now, what happened on that road to Emmaus and what is happening with us right now, what happened in the book of Acts, what we're all walking out is a fulfillment of a promise in the Bible. And I want to look at Leviticus 26. Hands up if you love a bit of Leviticus. <laughs> Gotta love a bit of Leviticus. Come on, give me some more Leviticus. All right. <clears throat> so, now, in chapter 26, these are all about rewards for obedience, okay? Rewards that God promises for obedience. Okay, who's the only person that modeled obedience perfectly? Okay, and who inherited the, in- who got to become co heirs with his inheritance? We did. Okay, so that's good context for this, right? So, verse 9. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you have to move it out to make room for the new. Wow, that would be good right now, wouldn't it? (laughs) We could do with some of that. Oh, come on. Um, I will put my dwelling place among you. Wow. Recognize some language. We've been talking about Ephesians, haven't we? Ephesians 2. We're becoming the dwelling place. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with your heads held high. Okay, now, we are living in that promise. We are living in that promise. Okay, so let's turn now to 2 Corinthians 6, and we're going to see that's not just Dave saying that we're living in that promise. It's actually the Bible says it too. It's not just Dave's view. Okay, 2 Corinthians 6. Now, in 2 Corinthians 6 and coming, lean, coming, coming out of 5 as well, in 5, you know, Paul's been talking about our heavenly dwelling and the reality of our heavenly dwelling and how we are all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And because of that, he's like, we understand what the fear of the Lord is responding to the reality of our dwelling place in heaven and that we are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then he's talking about how we all have the ministry of reconciliation and we take that ministry seriously because we're going to have to give an account of it. Wow, you're like, Dave, that's heavy. Okay, and then out of that, he then goes on, and if we pick this up from verse 14, so chapter 6, verse 14, that's the context leading into it, and it goes, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial. You know, Belial is, also, is another name for Satan. And in some translations, it says Beliah, which made me laugh. Be liar. It's a good name, isn't it? Um, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, and this is Leviticus 26 quoted that we just read, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Carrying on. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, 
quo, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you'll be son, my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then just the beginning of chapter seven. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of the fear of the Lord. Some say out of reverence for God. It's the same thing, out of the fear of the Lord. Now, why has Paul quoted this verse in this context? He's placed a fulfillment of a promise, a promise that was given a long time ago in Leviticus, and he's prayed, play, he's played, he's positioned that alongside a required response that he's put there. Now, this verse is, you've, I've heard it. When I remember when I was a new Christian, I heard this verse used in the context of you should not date non-Christians. Anyone else heard it used in that context? Now, I want to say it's much more than that. It's much more than that. It's, all, it's about influence. It's about influence. Paul's just been talking about your ministry. Our ministry is the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to God. That's a relationship where I'm influencing them more than they're influencing me. Make sense? And so what he's talking about here is do not be yoked to unbelievers. He's not just talking about the context that we might have heard. It's much broader than that. Now, influence today is multifaceted. Obviously, there's your interpersonal stuff, interpersonal relationships, but it's also so much bigger than that. It's media. It's media as well. It's the media that you consume. That's a relationship with the world. That's a rela- you might not realize it, but that's a relationship with the world. What's influencing you? Who's influencing you? What's got access to your heart? Now, good thing to look at is what does it mean to be yoked? Now, for anyone who doesn't know, this is like a farming image, isn't it? Where you've got like two cattle and they've got like a harness and a big bar across over their, shoulder, over their necks and they are firmly fixed together and then they have like a plow between them. So the cattle can go along and they're plowing, plowing up the ground behind them, which is, resonates with the word that Karen gave. Sorry? Oh, was it Colleen? Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry, Colleen. <laughs> um, so picture this. You've got these two animals going two different, two different directions, yeah? If you're being yoked with somebody who's partnered with Christ and somebody who isn't, whether that's your best friend, somebody you met in the pub, or TikTok, It doesn't matter. That's going in one direction, you're going the other. Now, if one of those animals is stronger than the other, what's going to happen? One is going to end up going in that direction, right? It's it's unavoidable. The larger or the stronger will dominate the smaller. So the good question to ask yourself in any relationship, whether it's with a person or whether it's a piece of media that you're consuming is, Okay, where's the majority of the influence coming from in this situation? It is obviously good to have relationships, friendships with non-believers. We all agree that, right? I would suggest the Great Commission is going to be very hard to fulfill without that. If we just hang out with each other. But in the Great Commission, the balance of that relationship is clear. If the balance of influence is in the world's favor, in their favor, then they're discipling you. You're not discipling them. They're discipling you. That's scary. That's scary. So if you're being discipled by Netflix or Instagram or whatever it is, that's scary. Because who's discipling that person that put that together? Who's discipling them? Who's behind that?
Now, I used to work in media, so I have some experience of this. I worked with a lot of the brands. I worked with, a lot, worked with social media brands that actually create these platforms. I worked with the brands that advertise on these platforms. We had a saying in advertising, which was, win hearts before minds. Win hearts before minds, is what we used to say. Now, I'll explain where that comes from. So, human beings, well, particularly in the West, right, we pride ourselves on being rational beings, don't we? We're rational. We're scientific. We've been, you know, we've been through the age of enlightened, enlightenment, which is kind of the age of stupid, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But actually, the truth of that rationality, the truth of that is actually quite rare. So in advertising for years, we worked with, we had this period where if you were working for the superior product or the, yeah, the superior product in the market, it doesn't matter whether it's a phone or um, vac, you know, vacuum cleaner, it doesn't matter what it was. There was, a, there was a logic that came out, a reasoning that came out that was like, okay, if you are genuinely the best, if you genuinely are the best performing product, then sell it. Sell it on that basis. Forget about all this just like getting people to love your brand nonsense. Actually tell them, okay, it's the fastest. It's got the, the you know, the, it's the, most, the best at picking up dust or whatever it is. Actually sell it on all those facts. You know what? It didn't work. People just bought the brands that they loved. Even they were more expensive and they didn't work as well. It's true. And so the whole industry kind of came back out the other side and was like, okay, forget that. It didn't work. <laughs> We've accepted that people are led by their hearts. And they actually used um, MRI imaging technology. And when, when, the, when people were watching advertising imagery of the most mundane, boring products ever that you would think no one's going to have any affinity with that brand. Who cares? You know, it's a, it's a wet wipe or whatever. Who cares? But actually, people, it was the emotional part of the brain that was triggering up. It was crazy. The rational bit did nothing. <laughs> the vast majority of the time, we make emotional decisions and then we develop afterwards ra post-rational arguments to, to convince ourselves that it was a rational decision. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I did that because, well, you know, I mean, they're clearly the best. And No, it was something else. And you see this with atheists. If you've ever had a conversation with an atheist, they will tell you that they have, got, they have come to the scientific argument, the scientific conclusion, the evidence-based conclusion or whatever it is, and the more you just sit and spend time with them without trying to get into an argument, but just connecting heart to heart, the more you realize, no, it was an emotional decision, that there was a hurt, there was a pain, there was a disappointment, something happened, and they turned their heart away from God, and then they sought after an argument that would back up what they decided to do in their heart. You're never going to argue them into the kingdom. Just, get in, just, really, just reach their heart. Why is this relevant to what I'm saying? The enemy knows that for a believer who is genuinely trying to go after Jesus, being yoked to something that is going to be harmful to your life is probably not something that most of us would intentionally do. We're not going to be like, oh, yeah, 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 let me have some more of that today. That's going to help me end up drifting away from God. No. He knows that. But once something has a hold of a little piece of my heart, where my, mind le where my heart leads me, my mind tends to follow. Why does that matter? Verse 16. We are the temple. We're the temple. We are the temple of God. Anyone remember Steph's amazing preach a few weeks ago? She meant, talked about this sign on the outside of the temple. 
Do you remember about the warning of ensuing death if you went in there? Anyone remember that? That same God says of you and I, I will live with them and walk among them. Where you would have died if you went before, he says, I have come to bring that to you. I've brought that to you. You are my dwelling place. It's only because of Jesus that I don't die in that presence. Did that presence become any less holy than it did on the days when they had that sign up? Did it? Did it become any less holy? No. I got clothed in his worthiness. Now, in verse 17, it goes on to say, Therefore, come out from them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And then Paul goes himself on to say, in uh, seven, uh, chapter 7, beginning of chapter 7, Therefore, let us... Um, since we have these promises, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates. What's he talking about? It's talking about consecration, living a consecrated life to God. Did anyone notice Jesus touched the unclean all the time? In fact, when Jesus touched the unclean, he made it clean. Did you know, he gave the same instructions to us, didn't he? Remember when he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons? What do all those four things have in common? They were unclean. Somebody with an infectious disease had to be isolated out of the camp. Dead bodies, unclean. There were rules about that. Leprosy, unclean. Demons, another word for them, unclean spirits. They were all unclean. And Jesus says, hey, go touch them. Go make those things clean. It makes me laugh because it was in Matthew 10 that he told them to go out and do that. And he didn't explain why until Matthew 15. <laughs> so you got the apostles like, huh? What? <laughs> what? This is, no, this is bad. We can't do that. But they went out and did it. And then it's five chapters later, he explains why. <laughs> he had to choose those guys, didn't he? If he chose people that thought it through too much, it wouldn't have worked out so well. In Matthew 15, he says, it's what comes out of your mouth, which is from your heart. That's what makes you unclean. It's, what's the point? In the old covenant, I was contaminated by what touched my skin. In the new covenant, I'm contaminated by what I allow into my heart. Can I enjoy things in this world? Can I consume the media it produces? Yes. Yes. But what I can't afford to do is let it take a piece of that that belongs to him. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, the same writer, Paul, he's talking about food and the issue of cleanliness, says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. When I engage in something as an expression of my worship to him instead of separate from him, it makes it clean. I make it clean. You might say to him, Dave, Dave, you don't make it clean. Jesus makes it clean. Yes, but what did he say? Did he say, I will go out and cleanse, lep cleanse those with leprosy? No, he told you to do it. Christ in you. In the same way, Paul also says in Romans 14, he says that, and again, talking about food. Does anyone get the sense that Paul really liked food? <laughs> he does talk about food quite a lot. He says, everything that does not come from faith is sin. In other words, this has got everything to do with the posture of my heart and my conscience. 
In other words, is it part, this thing I'm doing, is it part of my relationship with the Lord or is it instead of it? We can enjoy those things, but unto the Lord, not instead of the Lord. Are there tiny parts of your life that are off limits for God, where he doesn't get a word in? He wants it all. He wants it all. Can I watch Netflix? Yes. But do you have Netflix or does Netflix have you? Can I go on TikTok or do gaming with my friends this weekend? Yes. But if it's not unto the Lord, it might be instead of the Lord. Ouch. I believe we are in an invitational moment as a church. And my heart is that we would fully respond to him with the biggest 100% yes that our hearts could ever give in this season. Because I don't want us to miss out. Now, I've talked to loads of different people about the journey that Eastgate's been on these last few months, four or five months, and everybody's like, oh, it's so exciting. We've tasted his glory, haven't we? This morning, at the, that, there was a time in the worship where I just felt like we were lost in his glory, in the awe of who he is. But I, the question I have is, are you happy with that? Are you happy there? Are you happy to stay there? Or do you want more? Some people want more. Four people want more. Are you happy there or do you want more? More. He wants to know how much we want it. Because there will be a cost. There will be a cost. Doesn't promise easy. Anyone here ever surfed before? A couple of people. So I used to I used to surf a long time ago. Still got my board, even though it doesn't get any use now, but I'm clinging on to the fact that it's still part of who I am. <laughs> even though it's not, but I'm telling myself it is. Anyway, when I used to surf, I went to California to learn when I was at uni for like four or five months. And um, by Californian standards, I was terrible. Then I got back to the UK and I'm actually, oh, quite good. <laughs> <laughs> In California, I was watching like these eight-year-olds do 360 airs off the waves, and I'm like, huh? <laughs> um, but one of the things about when you learn to surf, what you realize is that, so on these, on, in places where there is consistent good surf, is when you're, the, when you're a beginner, you go in the, what's called the breakers. So you don't go out where the big waves actually start. When you have a big wave, and that big wave is coming in, and it eventually crashes, it churns up in all that frothy water. You've seen that? And then that, on, that tends to build up again, and then they create waves. And it's shallower. It's normally around knee deep, so it's safer. But you can genu- genuinely ride those waves. So as a beginner, that's where I learn, and that's where everybody learns. But you're learning there on these waves, and you're feeling really good when you catch one of these little breakers, and then you just watch these guys just running out past you and disappearing like dots to catch the real ones out there. And there comes a point where you're like, okay, I could stay here and have fun in these breakers that are part of the waves that someone else was part of that when that was formed, yeah? Or I could go out there and swim against these big scary waves, swim against the current, face the resistance, and be part of the new waves that are being made. You have to choose, okay, I'm going to meet the resistance. I'm going to swim against that current. There is a current of society today that if you want to go after what God's got for you, you've got to choose to swim against that. With Not just here when we're here together, it's every single little decision we make across the week. And we're choosing to swim against that because I want to be part of that new wave, God.
Would the band be able to come back up? Is that all right? So, still here. We're nearly done. When God says, I will walk among you, in this promise that's from Leviticus 26, then requoted by Paul, when, it's, when he says, I will walk among you, the, re, the root of that word among means to be right at the center, right in the thick of it. It can also be translated within. I'll be right in within you. Now, in Matthew 11, you'll remember when Jesus said that famous kind of thing where he said, Take my yoke upon you, didn't he? All you who are weary and burdened, take my yoke upon you. That was an evangelistic invitation. Did you know that? How do we know that? Because he says, I will give you rest for your souls. Now, if you read Hebrews, Hebrews will tell you that as a believer, rest is your inheritance. So offering rest for your souls was an evangelistic invitation. In the old covenant, I had to come out from the world physically, become physically separate. In other words, unyoked from the world in order to be with him. In the new covenant, he says, I have come down. I will be right with you, amongst you, within you, joined to you, yoked to you, if you will, so that together we can yoke the world to me. We've got a way better promise, a way better mandate. That's what Paul was talking about with the ministry of reconciliation. It's we're in the yoking business. You and me, we're in the yoking business. Now, so why is he saying do not be yoked to unbelievers? He's not just saying it to limit your life. He's not just saying us that I want to take fun off your life. He's saying, if you're yoking yourself to them, it's because you didn't see that I came so you could be yoked to me. Really yoked to me. So that together we can yoke them to me. That's why you're here. That's the job. That's the only reason you're not sucked up into heaven right now. We are beginning to taste the glory at Eastgate, aren't we? And the Lord is asking us, I believe, at Eastgate, how much do you want this? How much are you willing? How much are we willing to pay the price? How much will we prize this? Would you stand? Because I like to pray. This doesn't have to look like any particular way. It doesn't matter. But I just want you to, everyone to close your eyes and just respond to God. Respond to how he's pressing your heart today. Respond to how he's stirring. Let him stir your heart. If you want to wail, wail. If you want to cry, cry. If you want to be silent, be silent. But I just feel like the Lord wants to stir our hearts to yield them fully to him. You might have been running after him hard for like 20 years and never felt like there was a part of you that was separate from him. But I feel like today, maybe he's just showing you, God, there's more. There's more I can give you, God. There's more of my heart I can give you. So I just wanna ask you, I want you to ask him a question right now in the quiet of your heart. Lord, are there parts of my life that have been instead of you, instead of onto you? Whoa. Are there parts of my life I'm doing instead of you, instead of onto you? I just feel like the Lord is saying, come out from them, come out from them and be fully yoked to me now. Be fully yoked to me now. Be fully yoked to me now. Fully, fully Fully, I want it all. I want your whole heart. I want your whole heart. I want your whole heart. 
I want your whole heart. I'm not telling you you did anything wrong. It doesn't mean you need to feel bad about yourself. This is not about beating you over the head with anything. It doesn't mean you've been living your life wrong. Maybe you have been living your life wrong. But it doesn't mean it has to be about that. It's just this, God, I discovered there was another percent of my heart that I hadn't seen before. And now I must yield it to you. I must yield it to you because you're so worthy. You can't afford to be yoked to them because it's your destiny to yoke them to him. That's who you are. Lord, would you sever us, sever us, sever us from the lies, lies that would penetrate our hearts and steal any part of them away from you, any part of them away from you, any part of them away from you. He wants your whole heart. If you feel that you want to respond to God in this moment, This is not about like hyping anything up or anything like that. It's not about what it looks like. But as a sign, would you come to the front and so I can pray for you? If you want to respond, it doesn't mean you've been living wrong. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong with your life. It doesn't mean that you haven't been walking with God. But it's like, there's a God. I don't want anything in my heart getting in the way of revival. I want, you know, revival happens in your heart. Revival isn't something that visits a room. Revival is when a heart becomes fully present and yielded to Him. Fully present and yielded to Him. Fully present and yielded to Him. He is just, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. He's just looking for a people. It could be anyone, anywhere. Look at what's happening in America. It doesn't have to be, oh, this amazing church that's got all these things together. It's just people who will yield hearts fully to him. So Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, we just pray. God, we give you the sacrifice of our hearts. We give you the sacrifice of our hearts. We give you the sacrifice of our hearts right now. I just want to see, I just want you to see your heart as an offering. Lay it on the altar to him right now. Lay it on the altar to him right now. Lay it on the altar to him right now. God, we want revival. We want revival. We want revival and we know, God, revival is not something that visits us. God, it starts inside my heart. It starts inside my heart. God, would you cleanse my heart of anything, anything, anything that is holding me back to be 100% fully, fully into you, all for you, all for you, Jesus, all for you. All for you, Jesus. Yes, Father, All for you. Everything, Jesus. Everything we give unto you, Father. Everything we surrender, Jesus. We don't want to reserve anything, Father. Everything, Jesus, we bring to your feet. Everything, Jesus, in exchange for you, Father. In exchange for your heart. In exchange for what you've done for us on the cross, Jesus. We give you everything, Father. Yes. We're not reserving anything in us, Jesus. Yeah. Have your way in us, oh God. Have your way in us, oh Jesus. We say yes to you, Jesus. Yes. In every area of our lives, Jesus. We say yes to you, Father. And we can't do this without you, Jesus. You will have to do it with us, oh Lord. For you are who you say you are, Jesus. Yes. Help us, Father. We want more of you, Jesus. Yes. We want more of you, Savior. Yes. We want more of your Redeemer. We want more of your transformation, Father. We want more of your renewal, Jesus. 
Father, we want to see you in our generation. So we say surrender. We surrender as parents. We surrender as school teachers. We yeah. surrender as health carers. Yeah. We surrender to you, Father, that you may find expression in us, Jesus. Yeah. That you may use us, for we are only vessels, Father. That through us, Jesus, you may be, Lord. We surrender everything, Jesus. Everything unto you, Father. Take everything, Jesus, everything, Jesus, our mind, our souls, our bodies. For nothing stands, nothing stands before you, Jesus. You are everything, Jesus. Have your way, Lord. Yes. After I said that about the putting, seeing your heart going on the altar, as Judith was praying just then, I just saw like this sense of like, as the, your heart was on the altar, all your hearts was on the altar, were on the altar. Because fire falls on sacrifice, doesn't it? <laughs> and I just saw the fire of God come down on your heart, set it on fire, and it was like turning gold, not just red, like natural color, but like golden and fire coming out of it. And then it was just floating back into your chest floating back into your chest and then out of your chest was just exploding the multifaceted wisdom of God so father in the name of Jesus God I just pray for an increase of your fire an increase of your fire to fall on everyone right now an increase of your fresh fire to fall right now in Jesus name thank you God Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Lord, may we be, may we be nothing other than all in for you. Yes. Nothing other than all in for you. Nothing other than all in for you. Nothing other than all in for you. In the glory of your presence, I find rest for my soul in the depth of your love. I find 
in the glory of your presence. I find rest for my soul in the depth of your love. I find peace makes me whole. I love crying out loud the love that the Lord has given you was never in doubt let go of your heart let go of your head and feel it now let go of your heart let go of your head and feel Hi, everyone. I can't hear anything. Hello, 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 hello. Hi, everyone. Um, downstairs, there's a youth parents like gathering with cake. So if you're parents of anyone in youth, please make your way downstairs to the youth room. It's the one, if you look at the cafe, it's to the... Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. If you're, yeah, so if you want to, if you're a parent of youth, go to that meeting. The rest of you, just let's just keep worshipping him. Let's just keep worshipping him. <laughs> 